Well, great to see everybody here today. It's a wonderful, wonderful day to be together with you. If you're visiting with us, especially if it's your very first time, then we encourage you to fill out a visitor's card. You just ask any one of our members. We've got deacons in the back of the auditorium who will hand those out. If you have not gotten one of those yet, we just would like to reach out to you this week and ask uh, if there's any spiritual needs that you have, how we as a church of God's people can be useful and helpful and uplifting to you. If you're interested in studying anything that you see or hear today, then please let us know. We'll open up our Bibles together with you, and for any Bible question, we'll strive to provide a Bible answer and be totally transparent and totally honest with you about what we see from the Scriptures. I hope that you are here for the 9 a.m. lesson. Uh, if you were not, I encourage you uh, this week, I'll put it online, I'll make sure that, uh, that it gets made available publicly. It was Preston Nichols' first lesson that he's done here officially as our preaching intern. And so it was, I'll, I gotta say, it was his best lesson that he's done. <laughs> Absolutely his best lesson that he's done here. So I applaud Preston for that. But he took his lesson from Colossians chapter 3. There's a great passage there, and he read a, a great big chunk of that chapter and then drew a bunch of lessons from a good practical information. His lesson is actually a really nice foundation upon which this lesson could be built. And essentially, in a nutshell, what Preston talked about from Colossians 3 was that when you are in Jesus Christ, you have been raised from your spiritual death with the hope in the future of an actual physical resurrection from the dead so that for eternity you will be in the presence of God uh, experiencing and living out his glory uh, in endless time and wonder. But while we're here on earth, we have to show that resurrected life in our behavior. You don't just think it. You don't just have faith and keep it inside of you. Faith is something that is expressed and acted out, as he pointed out from the text, both in our, our words, our speech, are we speaking kindly to each other? Are we speaking truth? Are we saying what needs to be said? Are we doing away with anger and wrath and malice and abusive speech? And also, it has to be shown in our morality, our moral behavior. How are you using your body? How are you using your hands? Are you abstaining from sexual immorality? There's a great little point that I want to draw from Colossians 3. If you want to turn back there, you may still have your Bibles marked from this morning. But there's a little point here in Colossians 3 and verses 6 and 7 that I want to point out. A phrase that is important before we move into the meat of this lesson. In Colossians 3, verses 6 and 7, For it is on account of these things, the, the immorality and the passion and evil desire that he mentions in the previous verse, it's on account of these things that the wrath of God will come. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. Sin is not just something that you do. Sin is not just a one-off thing like a chicken laying an egg and then just walking away from it. Sin is something that you live in. It touches every part of your life. It infects and it corrupts you. It follows you wherever you go. It, it leaks and it spills into other areas of your life. I want to talk about addiction today. And this is part one of a two-part series that I'm going to be doing. In our lesson today, I want to talk about the basis for addiction, why and how it is that we become addicted to things. And maybe we should be expanding our definition of what we typically think of as addiction because a lot of us might look at this and go, well, it's a good thing I'm not an addict, which means my part of today's worship service is officially over. Thank you, Ryan, for the free half hour. But if we open up our minds and look at addiction as more in line with what we've read in Colossians chapter 3, that all sinful, all sinful behavior can be addictive. And, and I think is habit-forming and addictive by its very nature. And that all sinful behavior is not just something that you do. You do it once and then you walk away and maybe you do it again and then you walk away. It's not like eggs that get hatched and you just leave them behind. No, sin is something you live in and it, and it touches your life and it sticks with you like a stain on an article of clothing. And, and maybe if we think of addiction more in those terms... 
we might realize the addictive behaviors that we, the non-addicts in the room, are actually practicing almost on a daily basis. Let's go first of all to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 19. I just want to read this one phrase from that passage. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. Sadly, addiction seems to be a growing problem that nobody in the church ever wants to talk about. Now, we'll give lip service to the addictions that, that, that are convenient enough for us to talk about. Like, preacher man, we really need you to do a lesson on, on alcohol. Gotcha. We'll do a lesson on alcohol. Because I think most of us in this room aren't addicted to alcohol. Now, some may be. But you can preach a lesson like that. It kind of keeps it at arm's length for everybody. I want you to hit those drugs. I really hit those drugs hard, Ryan. That's right. I'm going to really hit on the heroin addict hard in this lesson. Well, that's fine because for most of us, we can keep the heroin addict at, at arm's length. And it doesn't really touch our lives. Uh, gambling? Okay. Maybe, maybe gambling starts to get a little more uncomfortable for people in the room. That might be true starts to get uncomfortable. Well, what about 20 bucks on the game every now and then? Surely that's not what you're talking about. And then you get into things like being a shopaholic. Yeah, we joke about being a shopaholic. Yeah, there she's spending her money again. Don't, don't infer too much from the fact that that was a, she was spending her money again. It's a 50-50. I could pick he or she. It just, you know, at random. And then we start talking about things like gluttony. And, 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 and then it gets harder and more uncomfortable. And then, then we start talking about the addictive nature of our cell phones and social media. And, and then at that point, you've lost everyone in the room. But let me tell you something. Peter means it when he says this. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. And I don't care if it's something horrible and illegal or if it's something perfectly Obnoxious finger quotes coming at you, harmless and innocent, which it really isn't. But if you're overcome by something, no matter what it is, by that you are enslaved. And anybody who's enslaved to the things of this world is not actually serving Jesus Christ, at least to the degree that is expected of him. Remember what John wrote. The Apostle John made a statement in 1 John chapter 2 that I think should have all of us very concerned for our lives if we have not aligned our will with God's fully. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world... The love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. And so clearly, both John and Peter agree on this idea that when you elect things in your life control you and overcome you and dictate you, then you're not really serving Christ. You're serving the world. You're serving the world. And there are going to be some uncomfortable things that we talk about today as well as in a couple weeks when we really get to the practical application in part two, because that's what we're really heading toward. Today is all about just how do we become addicted to things? What does that look like? What's the process involved in addiction? And part two is going to be, all right, now that we've all been honest and shown our cards and claimed and owned what's going on in our lives, how do we break that hold that sin has over us? A little bit of the technical stuff here, and I want to be up front. You know that I'm not an expert on these things. Took a couple of psychology classes in college, though. But I actually have a point to make about that, that I am not an expert on human psychology, and yet the information that we have available on human psychology, especially things like addiction, is so readily available that even someone who is not an expert doesn't have to look far for useful, reliable information about how the process of addiction works. And I think that that says something. Someone who's not an expert can learn about this, and it is accessible information to even 
someone like me who's not an expert. Pleasant experiences is where it begins because we don't become addicted, at least at first, we don't become addicted to unpleasant experiences. Nobody ever, nobody ever starts off being addicted to like wasp stings or anything like that. It starts with a pleasant experience, and pleasant experiences cause a flood of dopamine into the nucleus of humans, also called the brain's pleasure center. Another part of the brain called the hippocampus lays down memories of this rapid sense of satisfaction, thereby creating a connection between the, the drug, and we use that term very loosely, by the way, the drug and its effects. Essentially, you have different parts of the brain that when nice things happen to you, there's a chemical response in your brain. And then another part of your brain comes in and says, hey, log that one away. Let's remember when we do that, something nice happens and it sure feels good. So let's log that away and remember that the next time so that when someone offers something to you of the same nature, you go, oh yeah, we like that. That one feels good. The amygdala then processes a conditioned emotional response to that stimulation. This is the desire. That's where the desire comes from. So you have a pleasant experience. There's a flood of dopamine. Another part of your brain comes in and says, log that one away. Put that in the record books. And then another part of your brain comes in and produces the, the desire, the motivation, the will to want to keep doing something. And that's sort of where the addictive behavior tends to come from is the connection between all of those things. We're not meant to be overstimulated. And there's certainly nothing wrong with pleasant experiences here on planet Earth. Even the Bible is filled with examples of men and women who experienced nice, pleasant things. Food can be a very pleasant thing. Weather can be a very pleasant thing. Human relationships and the sexual union between a man and a woman can be very pleasant things. And they're not in and of themselves, evil or bad. But when you become overstimulated by those things, you become oversaturated by those things because of a choice that you've made to oversaturate yourself. It's at that point that the brain becomes mm, a little bit fried from the oversaturation. Now, I'll add it up in this way, and I can, if you would like to, I can print these notes up. I know it's a lot of information on a slide. I don't normally try to put that much information on the slide, but I'll make these publicly available to you at some point. So let's kind of read this in more detail. Uh, but normally, rewards come only with time and effort, right? You, you, normally, you have to earn something. If you want to eat something nice, you got to go cook it. And so you have to earn that somehow. Um, if you want to enjoy the sexual relationship to its fullest, you have to put the work into other parts of your relationship. The effort that goes into communication and friendship and support, right? That you got to put the work in to get that reward out of it. Addictive substances, however, and behaviors provide a dramatic shortcut to that. Instead of having to earn the good feeling... The addictive substance or drug comes in and says, oh, I can get you that feeling right here, right now, no effort required. So your brain says, well, yeah, sure. I mean, if I don't even have to work, absolutely. But what happens is you, that shortcut, that shortcut goes around the level of effort that's supposed to be involved. You're not supposed to feel good until you've done the things that you need to do to feel good. You've got to earn it, put the work in. And that's the problem with addiction. Addiction promises you that shortcut into feeling good. And by the way, as I talk about addiction, I want to be clear in the language that I'm using. Just because you are addicted to something or that their addictive tendency might exist doesn't necessarily that you are in sin. Because there are addicts who have made the choices, gotten the treatment, and put themselves in a position where the addiction that is still within them has been overcome insofar as one can overcome an addiction. So when I say sin, I mean sin. When I say addiction, I mean addiction. Sometimes those things overlap. Sometimes they overlap. But I think we need to be really careful in the language that we use. But that's the problem with addiction. And that's also the problem with sin. Sin promises you a shortcut where God says, yep, yeah, it's a long path. 
It's a long journey. There's a lot of work you're going to have to put in. If you really want to get anything out of marriage, then you've got to put a lot into marriage. If you really want to get something out of the labor of your hands, well, quite frankly, you've got you, you to labor with your hands. right? If you want to enjoy the fruit, you're going to have to put the work in to produce the fruit. And that's a real problem, isn't it? Okay, now in all of this, I guess we better ask an important question because you talk about the psychological side of it and the amygdala and the dopamine response and all that, and, and some people go, so what you're saying, Ryan, is that it's not really my choice. Like, I mean, if you're an addict, you're an addict and you can't really control it. The brain wants what the brain wants, and if we're wired a certain way or conditioned a certain way by our environment or our genetics, then, Ryan, are you saying that we just don't even have a choice and that the... the the physical side is all that there is. Well, clearly not. Clearly that's not what we're saying. In a sense, we, when we become addicted to something, we have made choices all along the way. That maybe the end destination is a very physiological thing. Like being an addict is a very physical, physiological thing. Your brain has been fried and rewired and tormented by an addictive substance to where there's a real physical outcome. But you had a thousand choices all along the way that led to that point. And I think that's the thing that we forget about is in our sympathy to the addict, which we ought to be incredibly sympathetic to the addict, in our sympathy for the addict, let's not forget that somewhere along the way there was a choice that initiated. There was a choice that, that got the first hook into the mouth. And so we need to be very aware of the choices that we make because the physical consequences are just that. They're, they're the physical consequences. Addiction, however, doesn't remove the free will, the free will that was involved in a thousand or a million different steps along the way. And the physical consequences do make it harder to make choices, but physical consequences don't remove the free will and the choices. Makes it harder, but it doesn't remove the choice. Now, we do need to address this. This is a conversation that has to be had. Like I said, it's very easy to keep things at arm's length and either speak in such vague terms about addiction that no one's toes get stepped on or to speak with such specific terms about addiction that we can be like, well, yeah, we're all on board with like, you know, the cocaine junkie. We're okay stepping on his toes because none of us in here are a cocaine junkie. And somewhere in the middle of that is a point where all of us need to be uncomfortable and examine ourselves a little bit more closely and find out, not keeping it at arm's length, but find out where it is in my life that I'm also showing a weakness for sin, where I'm, I'm leaving the door open because of my own choices for Satan to infiltrate my life with whatever it is, whether it's a substance or a behavior or a media or a, a relationship that's a terrible influence, am I an addict without even knowing it? So what really is at the core of addiction? Because it's not merely a physiological thing. It's not a physical thing by itself. There's a huge spiritual component to addiction that we need to acknowledge and that we need to explore, and that's what I hope to do. Now, getting back to this point, but I'm no addict. Here we go. All right, that's, that's fine. Everybody untie your shoes and let's kick, them, kick the loafers off and let's, let's go for it, right? Ryan, I'm not an addict. I've never, never touched the stuff. Well, I'm with you, just so I'm totally up front. I'm not doing this so you can pat me on the back and tell me what a virtuous young man I was. Never had a sip of alcohol in my entire life. Never smoked a thing. Never snorted a thing. Never stuck any. Listen, I don't even like getting a flu shot, okay? I, I'm, I'm the 39-year-old I'm the man who needs to get a sucker after he's done at the pharmacy getting a flu shot, Okay? So I'm no addict, right? What about sports betting? You know, that's one of those, and I'm not saying it is a gray area. And I can do a whole sermon on gambling if you want me to. I'm not saying it is. 
we kind of think it's a gray area. Like, I'm not going to a casino. What's the big deal? I get on a sports book and put 20 bucks on the game. It's a little you know, recreational gambling. What about social media, screen time, gaming? I mean, how much of your life is dominated and controlled by staring at your screen? In, in a sense, we've become, we've become like those apes from 2001, A Space Odyssey, and we're going around like this, and our cell phones are like a big black obelisk, and we just touch it, right? That's, that's, I hope that that is the only time that you will ever have to see me jumping around like a monkey from 2001, A Space Odyssey. But don't, isn't it like that though? Like we sit there in the glow of our devices, just scrolling our lives away. Isn't that addiction? Well, what about risky behaviors? Now, okay, I'm, not saying, I'm not saying you're sinning because you like to go whitewater rafting. But let me challenge you. Maybe, just maybe, at some point does it become a sin? Maybe you quit wearing the life vest because, you know, just want to have your arms free to really experience the white water. You know, we don't need, maybe, maybe you don't tell people that you're going white water rafting. Just kind of a surprise trip. You don't tell anybody where you're going. Leave your cell phone behind. Don't, don't tell your mom, your dad, your spouse what you're up to. At some point, don't the risky behaviors become addictive where you always, you're always trying to get like to the next big exciting high, the next big adventure? How about shopping? Especially as a coping mechanism for trauma or for grief. How about prescription drug abuse? I, I have had, I think rightfully so, I have had people over the years that when I do a lesson on alcohol, you need to come real, down real hard on alcohol. Come down on social drinking. Come down, you know, it's effective on our bodies and our brains and our influence in the community. And I have had people over the years come up and say, listen, that was a good lesson. I, I get what you're saying. How come you've never done a lesson on prescription drug abuse? Maybe we ought to have a talk about prescription drug abuse at some point. How about obsessive sexual behaviors or fetishes that you bring into your relationship with your spouse? To where you're always, you're always pushing the limits of what he or she is comfortable with. You're always pushing the limits of what, of, what is really, of what is really a beautiful and uplifting experience and turn it into something demeaning or humiliating. Don't those also become addictive at some point? Maybe we're all a little bit more addicts than we think that we are. When you start opening up that definition of addiction and start realizing anything, as Peter pointed out, anything that overcomes you enslaves you. Anything that overcomes you enslaves you. One will never be satisfied getting more of anything. And that's a little secret to life that it takes a lot of us a long time to learn. Because our, our lives are a lot like the float in a toilet tank. Right? You know, you got that floaty bubble there in the toilet tank, and when you flush the toilet, the water level goes down. Where does the float go? It goes down. And then the tank fills back up, and where does the float go? It goes back up. That's kind of how life is, that you know, when you're making $50,000 a year starting off, and you're like, wow, I'm making $50,000 a year. That's cool. And then like 10 years later, you get a big raise and you're making 75,000 a year. Wow, 75, this is great. I don't know how I could ever live on $50,000 a year. Then you get $100,000. And then you move, you move from the start house, the little two bedroom bungalow, which is just like, you know, it's our dream house. It's what we always wanted. And then you have a couple kids and a dog and well, we got to get a bigger yard and a second bathroom. And then every time, every time your life kind of goes up, don't your expectations also go up with it as well? But that's how it is. That's not just addictive things like alcohol and drugs. That's everything. Our, our desires and expectations rise and fall with our lives. And so when you're always going more, 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 I want more, I want more, I want more, you're displaying the very trap that Satan has laid for all of us. To where you'll never be satisfied again with less now that you've had a taste of more. You can never.
never go back once you've had the good stuff. You can never go back. And that's how it always is. Um, there have been studies done on people who win the lottery. Lots of studies in the pack. I, I have in my notes here, if you're curious about it, I have a study that was done by uh, Forbes magazine on lottery winners. And, and I have um, just a little bit here. The, the article was called, Why Winning the Powerball Won't Make You Happy. Because there's always short-term euphoria. And in fact, studies have shown that winners of the lottery report the same level of satisfaction with life long-term than what they had before they won the lottery. Like, at first, you're like, well, I won the lottery. That's amazing. But then, like I said, that toilet bowl float goes up. And you know what? So you're basically the same person now. You just have a billion dollars in the bank. But you're still the same person. You're still the same person with the same problems, with the same broken relationships, with the same regrets from your past, with the same guilt about your sins. You're still the same person. You just have a billion dollars in the bank now. And so if you believe that winning the lottery will somehow answer your life's problems, it doesn't. And study after study after study shows this, that when you get past the short-term euphoria, you just get used to your surroundings. No matter how opulent they are, you just get used to your surroundings. And eventually, a house is just a house. A car is just a car. And despite the dramatic jump in prosperity, lottery winners typically report the same level of happiness that they did before winning the lottery. And the Bible corroborates this in a great passage in Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 10. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with its income. There are two things that don't go together in this passage. Abundance and satisfaction. Now, in contrast to that, you can open, the book, the, open up the book of Philippians and hear what Paul has to say about his life's conditions and where his contentment was found. In Philippians chapter 4 and in verse 11, Not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. For I can do all things through him who strengthens me. You will never be satisfied by money, no matter how much of it you have. In all the abundance in all the world, if you have sold your soul, like Jesus points out in Matthew chapter 16, you've really lost it all. Proverbs 27 and verse 20. Proverbs 27 and verse 20 says, Sheol and Abaddon, that is death and the grave, they're never satisfied, nor are the eyes of men ever satisfied. That's where that more, more, more keeps coming in. Because the more you get, the more you want. And you're just ready for the next thing. No matter how much we pursue a thing, satisfaction always just seems elusive to us. Once we grasp it, we think, I've made it. I've got the thing that I've always wanted. The ecstasy from it quickly fades. And the intensity level has to be ratcheted up. You know, back when we were kids in elementary school, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, the D.A.R.E. officer would come. How many people remember the D.A.R.E. officer coming to school? That's, yeah, you, the D.A.R.E. officer coming. And I know, that, I know that, like, looking back on it, a lot of their tactics were very much, like, couched in the 90s, right? You, you kind of cornball stuff back then. But there was a term that the D.A.R.E. officer used that I think is as true today as it's ever been. It is gateway drugs. And again, I think some people kind of roll their eyes at it. It's kind of a corny, corny terminology. But there's a reason why the gateway drug is a real thing. Because once you've tried the exciting thing, eventually the exciting thing is not exciting anymore. It's boring. And you want to move on to the, the next thing. The next thing. And it's never satisfying. It always fades, and you got to move on. 
So when that intensity level fades, because of our, our need, it will always outpace our satisfaction, we're just left thirsty. Like drinking salt water to try and satisfy your thirst. The more you drink, the thirstier you get. And it should, it should seem obvious that all sins produce the same basic sense of restlessness. One is never satisfied with the short-term pleasure of pornography or the feeling of calm or excitement from various kinds of drugs, or the temporary release of stress through a violent outburst of some kind. All of those things are a waste of time in the pursuit of meaningful contentment because they don't address the core issue, godliness. It's godliness. And so we become overloaded. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 16 makes this observation. One of my favorite verses from the book of Proverbs, by the way, because it's so stark. Have you found honey? Well, honey's not a bad thing, right? Honey is a, is a good thing, isn't it? Well, have you found honey? Eat only what you need, lest you have it in excess and vomit it. Well, that's how all these addictive behaviors and substances are. You find a good thing, taste it, say, ooh, that's nice. The amygdala comes in, the hippocampus is writing memories for you in your brain, and, well, we should get that again. But the next time, I don't want just one spoonful. Let's do two spoonfuls. And then turns into three and turns into four, and you just don't know when to stop. There was a food that was ruined for me, and it would probably always be ruined for me. And I'm only, like, just now, like, like, like literally 30 years later, gotten to where I can eat it again. It's those cheddar and sour cream Ruffles potato chips. <laughs> you know, I, I, was, I was like nine or ten years old or something and got a hold of a bag of those guys and I'd just eat them and eat them and eat them and eat them and eat them. And then on the car ride home, well, you can guess what happened. <laughs> and I wasn't able to eat cheddar and sour cream Ruffles potato chips for a long time. And so this verse, Proverbs 25, verse 16, it makes a lot of sense to me. You know, God made our brains as these masterfully created, well-wired mechanisms, physical mechanisms, yes, physiological, biological mechanisms. They, they learn, they grow, they adapt, they interpret messages. And your body is always trying to tell you, your brain is trying to tell you enough is enough. The gag reflex, revulsion at something. Your brain is trying to tell you when enough is enough. But addiction overloads that process it causes desensitization to that process and sadly this means that we lose touch with the truly pleasing things of life because addiction makes it so that you don't even know what feels good anymore you can't even identify what feels good anymore because the wiring in your brain that teaches you pleasant experiences that remembers pleasant experiences has been so fried and overloaded that it doesn't work properly anymore and this leads to our last point today which is that we become calloused by that that the more you use and the deeper you go and, and, and the more you've overused something you just start to become like dull to it and you become calloused you know i read about the story of king solomon and i always wonder how is it that he ended up with 700 wives and 300 concubines that just seems like a really amazing thing to me that like you marry one person, well, that's not quite enough, so let's get two. But then I get a really great deal from another king on the other side of the world who says, well, let's, let's have you marry my daughter for economic purposes or political connections. Well, let's get three. And like, how do you go to 700 wives? And, and as if that's not enough, like, let's throw on some concubines in the mix because you just, you know, got a dull Thursday afternoon every now and then. In all seriousness, though, how does a person reach that level of incredible self-indulgence and overabundance and overuse of something? To where it's interesting that in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, the man who had 700 wives. In Ecclesiastes 9, the man who had 700 wives said, you want to know what your reward is in this life? If you can just have one wife who you really love. 
You think there's a little twinge of regret in Solomon's voice as he writes Ecclesiastes 9, verse 9? It'd be better to have one wife who you actually love than to have 700 wives who've led your heart away from God all these years. The Bible has a lot to say about the effects of self-indulgence. It confirms exactly what modern science has only just discovered about the brain, that the more you have of something and the, the deeper you go into self-indulgence and overabundance, it just ruins you. You just get calloused. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, for example, talks about the way that self-indulgence in the, in the desires of the flesh and mind lead us to have a warped nature. Romans chapter 16 and verse 18 describes men who are slaves of their own appetites. Titus 3 and verse 3 similarly uses the term enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, which only led to a life full of malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Isaiah 56, this is the last passage that we'll look at and we'll close. Isaiah 56 makes an observation that is just it's as true today as it's ever been. Come, they say, let us get wine and let us drink heavily of strong drink and tomorrow will be just like today, only more so. If that's not addiction, I don't know what is. If you're not a Christian here on this absolutely wonderful, beautiful Lord's Day, then it is time for you to look up. It is time for you to open your Bibles, open your hearts, and do what needs to be done to be right with God. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and you can confess that belief before others, if you're willing to resolve to put a life of sin behind you in repentance and to be baptized, not just dipped in water as just a mere symbol of something, but to have your sins washed away and to come out of the waters new, reborn. God can take the person so deep in sin that they are hopeless and helpless, which is exactly what Romans 5 says. And God can save that person. God can save you. But you've got to make that choice right now. You've got to start moving toward God. You've got to come forward as we stand and sing.